everyone, and welcome to the third episode of the BPD Bunch Talk Show. We have a panel of people who are in functional recovery from borderline personality disorder, and each week a few of us get together to discuss BPD-related topics to help give you insights into the different ways BPD can be expressed in someone's life. We also cover the different paths we followed on our recovery journeys to give you hope and direction for your own. For our first season, we're talking about each of the nine BPD symptoms, our experiences with them, and what helped us to overcome them. I'm your host, Zanny, and today I'm here with Alex, Jess, Sophie, Georgette, and Katya. How's everybody doing today? Good. Great. Good. Great. <laughs> well, where is everybody coming from? California today. From New York City. From the UK. Also from the UK. I'm in New Mexico. <laughs> I'm in Western Canada in a place called Calgary right now. So today we're going to talk about the third BPD symptom that's listed in the DSM-5, and that is identity disturbance or an unstable sense of self. So this is a really complex symptom. It can look totally different for different people, but really for most of us, I think generally we experience a lot of trouble knowing who we are, um, like especially in relationship to other people. So like some of us might not even know where we end and another person begins. Some of us not might not really know what our values are, our goals or our beliefs. My experience with identity disturbance, I don't feel like it was really that bad. I've always really known who I was deep down and I've always known what I wanted to do with my life. Like since I was little, I always felt like I wanted to do something that helped people and now here I am, I fell in love with psychology and that was it for me. But my sense of self was always like extremely fragile. Um, for example, if a bro like a boyfriend broke up with me, I would feel like I didn't know who I was and I was completely worthless. About like five years ago, I was going through a breakup and my BPD was at its worst at that time and I was writing a song and whenever I read those lyrics back now, I'm like, whoa, like my identity was really dependent on on this person and on this relationship. So I'm just gonna read the words from the chorus. Um, they were, I don't know who I am without you. So if you don't want me or you don't want to, then I'm unlovable, worthless, needy, an empty less than human being, then I'm invisible, a good for nothing girl. So these words, I feel like really explain my experience with identity disturbance. Um, thankfully, I'm in a place now where I know my worth and I don't really let my relationships going on around me change that depending on the status of them. Um, I know that I'm worthy and I'm loved and I have so much to offer this world, but it took me a really long time to get here and I can't wait to talk about how I got here. So I'm excited to hear what all of your experiences were with identity disturbance. All I gotta say is, oh my gosh, girl, same. <laughs> Yeah, your lyrics, when you were reading them, I was like, oh, man, that's my song, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a symptom that I tend to minimize because I do tend to have like a really strong sense of self and who I am, except when I don't, right? Except when <laughs> it's not happening. Things get really rocky. Like I will sometimes get still very outrageous ideas that I will like really mean and really believe. I work as a lawyer. I really like my job. I do like social justice work. I've been working at it for a really long time. I love what I do. Um, but just this year, there was a solid week where I thought I was going to leave that to go be an apprentice at a tattoo shop, you know, <laughs> and I was like so <laughs> convinced that this is what I was going to do. Um, over the summer, I wasn't working. And I was just like convinced I was going to move to Miami. I belonged there. And it was such a strong feeling of like, this is who I am. This is what I have to do. And then, you know, a couple months go by and like none of these things ever end up happening. But I like, I fall in love with ideas and I fall in love with like ways of feeling or ways of being very quickly and very deeply. Sometimes I fall in love with like particular aspects and other people and start emulating those things. And I start losing myself and like changing the way that I think, that I talk, that I feel. Probably the best and the worst feeling for me, and this is like along the lines of what Alex was saying as well, is when I do that when I'm in a relationship, right? I feel complete all of a sudden when I'm doing this like intense identity fusion in a relationship. And it's a beautiful, it feels amazing, right? It feels like so high. It feels like ecstasy. But then they go and they do something independently without me 
Or then the relationship ends and all of a sudden I'm not just grieving the relationship, I'm like grieving myself as well. I don't know where to go. I don't know how to behave. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to feel like. I don't know who I am anymore. That's probably the most difficult aspect of it. So I was just going to say that like the the falling in love with ideas and, and sort of changing who you are based on who you're with. I really, really, really relate to that. I've really struggled to know who I am. Honesty is one of the few things that I really felt like that's always been very important to me. And I generally resist lying to people. Um, like I would lie to protect someone else if I thought it was really important. But in general, I really try to avoid lying to people. And yet there's a big difference between intentionally lying to someone and saying something you think is true in the moment only to find that you don't really think it's true like 10 minutes later. And so that's always been a big struggle for me to when I'm fit, I do things because I feel like I fit in with that group in that moment. And then when I leave the, that group, I'm like, wait, why did I do that? Like in college, I partied a lot and drank a lot. And like, I was basically a drug dumpster. You give something to me, I take it be because you're doing it for no other reason, you know? Uh, and that was really hard. I totally get the, like, saying something because you think it's true. Like, you think it's true. You believe it. And then uh, 10 minutes later or the next day or the next month or whatever, all of a sudden, like, you're with somebody else and something else is true. This thing is not true anymore. This is true now. And getting called out on that is very difficult. Like, still don't so know how to handle that because it, it makes you seem flaky. It makes you seem unreliable. And that's not the case right? And yeah, thank you for saying that one. First of all, I want to say I really like hearing everybody and everybody's description because getting my diagnosis, I felt so alone and I felt so like stigmatized and to be able to sit in and listen, I feel so much less alone. For me, um, my experience of identity disturbance was I always use the phrase, um, I kind of see which way the wind is blowing and I just blow that way. <laughs> so on the upside, I feel like I'm able to be friends with like a wide variety of people. I feel like I have the ability to see things from others perspective, right? Because I'm so good at morphing into whatever I think the other person wants. I also am good at kind of reading the room or like reading you and, and finding something with you that I have in common. But the downside to it is I never was able to say who I was. I was married really young. So I got married when I was um, 22. So, and I wasn't diagnosed with um, BPD until I was 41. And I think a big part of why I was not diagnosed was because I was married so young. And I never went through, like Alexandra was saying, like going through breakups and dating and things like that. I never had that because I would like immediately attached to somebody. So like Jessica was saying with the um, like fall, somebody else becoming your identity, like that was totally what happened to me. I identified as my partner's wife. Everything's good till somebody goes off and does something on their own because then you feel so like left behind and empty. So I experienced that too. Like my partner was never able to really pursue anything on his own because I needed him around all the time. I could not tell you about myself. I had to defer to my partner. Well, I don't really know how I am, but if you ask him, I'm sure he'll tell you, right? And so I completely became whatever my partner said I was. And when things were good, that was fine because he said positive things. But when the relationship turned and we, you know, ultimately it ended up ending, I had no sense of self-worth at all. I just, I became all of the negative things that somebody says or um, feels about a partner in a breakup. I became selfish. I became these things. I just wanted to comment on what Georgia, you were saying about after you and your husband broke up and you felt like you were all those horrible things he was thinking about you. And I can like relate to that so much. I mean, like every time I've gone through a breakup and you're clinging on to it because like 
I mean, like Jessica said too, is like, you're not just losing the person, you're losing yourself too. So it's like, you're clinging on to that relationship so hard it, and it can come across as really desperate and needy, but it's like, because you're losing yourself in this person. And now this person is saying, you're crazy. You're like, you know, like you're, you're too emotional and all these things. And then, you know, you start to believe these things about yourself and, to the point, you know, where your self-esteem can become so, so low and your self-worth is absolutely nothing. And like, like in my song lyrics, like it was like, I'm, if you don't want to be with me, then I'm worthless. Then I'm nothing. I'm not even a human being. It's so powerful just to hear other people say the exact same words that you've felt for so long. Yeah. I was actually, when you were just speaking, I was like, it's just like your song lyrics. <laughs> it totally is. You know, I liked how Jessica said, you're not just losing that other person, you're losing yourself. So it's like, you're grieving that loss of self. I would say sometimes even more than the loss of the other person. And I speak a lot about it, like in terms of my, um, ex-partner, but looking back on like my friendships with people over the years, like in high school and throughout college, oh, these people are into this thing. Then that's, you know, I'm into that thing too. Like, oh yeah, we hang out and we go to thrift stores and that's what we're into is like thrifting or we like to party. So when I'm with this group of people, you know, yeah, let's do, let's do the drugs and drink the drinks, you know, cause that's what that group is doing. So when you lose, when I lost a friendship, like when a friendship would end, I'd have that same sense of just greet, like, well, well, who am I now? You know? And it wasn't that overt. Like I, my brain wasn't thinking that way. I wasn't saying those words to myself, but looking back, that was the feeling that I experienced whenever I experienced the end of a friendship or a relationship was this like, well, who have I got to be? Who am I going to be now? And I tended to go immediately into another type, like another relationship. I would get another friend really fast because then I had somebody who I could kind of hitch myself to and, and get that like, oh, well, this is who I, you know, this is who I am now. I feel like I can really identify with each bit of what you guys are saying. So thank you for sharing. I would say identity disturbance for me, I struggled with it from a young age. There was like a girl who was maybe three years older than me when I was about nine years old. But she literally became my favorite person very fast. She had a lot of influence on the people that I grew up with and adults and everyone. So she told me what I was supposed to be. Like anything that I would wear, she'd sort of be like, why are you wearing that? You look like this or like, so it was really easy to follow her. And she would often pick me up and drop me whenever she felt like it. Like whenever um, like things would go wrong with our families, she would sort of, just back out and say, hey, nope, I have nothing to do with this. My mom said I can't speak to you. And then I'd often feel like, okay, so who am I now? Uh, she was the one that was telling me what I was. I actually feel like I'm a blank canvas now, uh, finding my way back to my inner child. I think it's always important to start there. But um, yeah, just having so much identity disturbance, like changing my hair when I broke up with somebody. Like once I went bright red, I tried to kind of bleach it and it turned really ugly and it fell out. It was just <laughs> a no-go. <laughs> um, and I remember in secondary school, I had a friend um, and she was really into like Red Hot Chili Peppers. And thankfully I liked them too. And I really, <laughs> really became a fangirl, you know? And um, yeah, that was interesting. But then when we finished school, I was kind of like, okay, so what do I do now? Who do I like now? And I always liked George Michael. So um, I will definitely get a tattoo of him on my forearm um, <laughs> to uh, like cover up my self-harm scars. But um, that's, yeah, that's looming. Yeah, I've just find it, I found it really difficult to be in different groups. Like I have a very varied mixture of friends, which is great. I will kind of be in a group and if someone's like let's go to uni I'm like university I'm like yeah okay let's do that or if someone's like let's take drugs I'm like yeah let's let's do that like <laughs> <laughs> whatever it was I'll sort of go with it and I'll, I'll really convince myself that that is 
what I wanted and that's what I'm interested in and it feels real, you know? I feel like I can relate to what Georgette was saying and what Alex was saying about like when you break up with someone or when you're in a relationship and the negative aspects of what they have to say about you, like you really take that on and the positive aspects as well. So for a long time, I felt like I was manipulative and liar and selfish and all these things. It's been really painful kind of not knowing who you are. Um, and I found myself asking that question since I was a child. Who, who am I? Um, luckily for me, I kept a lot of journals um, where I'd say, I don't like rude people and I like drawing and I like dancing and things like that. So going back to my core, it's really hard at the moment because I just, I just don't know who I am, like what my value systems are and all of that. Um, yeah. Again, same. I think... <laughs> same <laughs> i'm so glad that you brought up the favorite person because mm. the favorite person is uh it's my research topic like i'm trying to introduce it to psychology because right now psychologists and i don't i don't know if you've noticed this but if you go to a therapist and tell them what you're about your favorite person they're not gonna have any idea what you're talking they're about like, what so what i'm trying to do <laughs> is introduce it to the psychology world and like get it into literature and stuff the favorite person is our identity like at yeah. its core, the yes. favorite person is who we are. That's why they're, they are our favorite person. That's why they can make or break our day. That's why we can take on like however they feel about us is how we feel about ourselves because they are our identity. So it's like when we say favorite person, it's like saying this person is my identity in a way. Yeah. And before diagnosis, I just thought that, you know, I was just living life the right way you know just if someone likes something I like it too and I really convince myself that that's what I like and that's that and then it changes from person to person and that can be really difficult because then who who, who the hell are you like who is she you know <laughs> well Sophie when you were talking you talked about when you were little you had that person who told you like who you were and it was the same with me. Like I had my, I was very, very close to my nanny B and that was my first FP or favorite person. And I was whatever nanny B thought, thought I was. And I was wonderful because <laughs> yeah. I was, I was her favorite person too. And then Alexandra, I just want to say, that's great. I heard about favorite person on like Instagram, you know, cause I follow like BP, I was trying to figure stuff out and I'm talking to my therapist about it. And they're like, huh? And I said, how, <laughs> how are you working with, how are you doing DBT? And you don't get this. Like I read about an FP and, and thought somebody had like read my mind. Like I, and I'd mm -hmm. never heard of it before, but I was like an FP. I have that. And my experience of it, like with my partner being my FP was how utterly horrific that is for the other person, like for the FP, at least in my case, because I was a hundred percent reliant on that person. And I actually also relied on my favorite person to regulate my mood, to mm -hmm. make sure like if he wasn't okay, I wasn't okay. But when mm -hmm. I wasn't okay, it's like not okay on a level 11. You know what I mean? So like it became this really abusive, um, relationship in which the favorite person had no room to be anything other than my favorite person. So Katya hasn't said very much yet. I mean, basically, I can pretty much empathize with what everyone has said so far. Like Sophie, my issues with identity really started quite young. And I think for me, it's linked to that fear of rejection and abandonment. So when I was younger, I always thought if I change, you know, X, Y, or Z, then I'll fit in and I'll be accepted, which I don't think is that unusual when you're young and at school because nobody wants to be the outsider. But it does lead to a lot of problems with authenticity and confusion over who you are as a person. So for me, I would pick people who I admired or people who I thought had qualities that I wanted in myself and I felt that I didn't have and then I would try and emulate them so whether I knew them or not it was not really a great way to go um it did lead to 
I would say sort of like an identity osmosis <laughs> where you kind of take on like <laughs> those characteristics <laughs> that you really want. Um, but obviously it's not healthy. And I think for me, the light bulb moment was really when I was at university and I hadn't seen my family for quite some time and they came to visit. And I've got a friend and I wouldn't maybe go as far as saying that she was a favorite person, but we spent an awful lot of time together. And where my family came to see me, they actually commented on the fact that my accent had changed and the way that I pronounced things had changed and I got exactly the same inflections as this person, which obviously I hadn't noticed. Um, but for them, it was quite obvious. And I thought, okay, like this is probably a problem. And I didn't even know that I had BPD at that point. It's not really something that I see as a massive negative now. I think it was maybe um, Georgette that was saying, you know, it is in some ways an asset because you can read people really well. It makes you quite adaptable depending on your environment as well. So all of these like hobbies and things that I've acquired along the way, they have been really useful in terms of building rapport with other people because chances are no matter how weird somebody's interest is I will have been there and done it <laughs> so when you're having a conversation with somebody it's really easy to build up that rapport with them because you've got that shared experience and that shared interest you just said the accent thing and that I mean I think to a certain degree it's it's pretty regular to kind of pick up words or ways of speaking from the people around you right from whatever you're hearing but I I always thought that the way I talked changed, that my accent would change a little bit, that I would pick up words from other people. I always thought that like in my mind, in myself. But then I, I remember one time listening to like a recording of myself and I was like, oh, nothing's changed. I'm still, I'm still speaking the way I was speaking like a year ago. But in my mind, I had like really fused myself more to, to that other person, to my favorite person. And I think for me, that just spoke to like, you feel like you become one with your favorite person in a lot of ways. Like you feel like you're one person. I would sometimes get confused between me and them, what the differences are sometimes, because I'm just, my assumption is always that we're like, we're the same. And I even like convinced myself that like my accent had, the way I spoke had changed, but like it hadn't, it was just, you know, in my mind and in my thoughts. And like, that's, that was a strange realization for me. But yeah. I don't know if anyone else is in this position, but I had a best friend throughout my entire childhood and into my adult life who also had BPD. Um, unknown to both of us, we didn't know that we both had BPD. Even when she was diagnosed, it didn't occur to either of us that I might have it as well because we present in completely different ways. She was probably also my favorite person. So you can imagine the confusion when you are trying <laughs> to mirror somebody and when you are taking on aspects of their identity when they also don't have an identity. When I was growing up, it was definitely problematic trying to find somebody who I could use as kind of like a healthy role model, really. Not that she is unhealthy because of her BPD, but just because there was so much confusion going on with identity. <laughs> I'd like to add to that, that um, after I fell out completely with that friend from childhood, I found myself like repeating the same patterns. Like she was quite a powerful influence. So I'd find powerful, like influential women in my eyes and I'd follow them so like I said when they say let's go to university I'm like great yeah they're like let's join a debate team I'm like of course you know <laughs> so uh, yeah I literally feel like a blank canvas now and trying to figure it out because I've gotten rid of all the noise of these influential quote-unquote people you know Alex and I were talking about what I was going to talk about for this because <laughs> because this is a really big most big problem and and probably something I still struggle with and I think for me, one of the things that stood out is this fear of like time and loss where I, I don't like the unknown, but I don't like the known either. Like I both dislike certainty and uncertainty. I like the idea of infinite possibilities, but I don't want to be stuck in any one. It feels overwhelming and trapping to nail one down. Like I like dreaming. I like being in that place where I can think, oh, I could be anything. 
But when I actually have to decide who I am, that felt like a suffocating trap. You know, I went through a mourning period when I got engaged. So it wasn't because I didn't want to marry him. And it wasn't even because I was afraid of commitment. Some of it was because I was nervous that I would have more to lose if I had a husband instead of a boyfriend. But more than anything, it was once I got married, my wedding would be behind me. And then whatever happened, mm. that would be the story. I wouldn't be able to dream about all the different things that my wedding could be. Ah. It would be, it would be something. That's interesting. Yeah. I think my identity has always been like that. I can't dream about who I could be if I pick a university, if I pick a career, if I know my values. I can't dream about all the different people I could be. Then I am someone. And what if, what if that person's wrong? What if there's something wrong with that? Um, and, and that was, that was really suffocating for me. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's something anyone else experienced. It's a very, I, I've never heard well, anyone else say that, but. I haven't heard anybody else describe it that way, but I, yeah. that's a really interesting way to describe it. What I picked up on and what you're, you were saying was that sense of, I could be wrong because I think that's something that I've noticed as a commonality is that fear of being wrong and that fear of not being and, and who are you wrong with? Like in somebody else's eyes. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like challenging to, to say, this is my identity because you're putting it out there. And just like Katya said, you can be rejected. So almost forming your sense of identity is very, very frightening when you also have this deep sense of worthlessness and this fear that you're going to be wrong or you won't be perfect and therefore you are bad. And so like saying this is who I am, you're putting that out there and somebody can say they don't like you, which is like devastating, I think, when you have this diagnosis for, for a lot of us. It's it's devastating to hear that like somebody doesn't like you because it ties directly into what Katya was saying, that fear of rejection. And it's scary to put yourself out and make a decision and say this is who I am because then you're putting you're you're vulnerable. Absolutely. And I think that I think you touched on it hundred percent. We want to transition into how we deal with it. And uh, since I have you, Georgia, you know, you wrote a great post that's up on our Instagram. One of the things that helped you a lot was identifying your values. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can. In my recovery, I realized that I needed to love myself, right? And I said, well, how can I love myself when I don't even know who I am? Like, I couldn't describe myself to you beyond like, well, I'm married to this person and I have these children. So one of the first things I had to do was find my my values. And that was like the big turning point for me in being able to develop my own sense of self. So I did it in therapy. I got this huge list of values and I went through and I just kept like checking the ones that I thought, yeah, that could be me. Yeah, I feel that way. And, you know, you go from like 25 things and then I narrowed it down to 15 and 10. And eventually I settled on six values that I thought this is something that I either already identify with or this is something that like I emulate and want to be. Once I had those values laid out, I could start referring to them because a lot of times in therapy, they ask you like, well, does this align with your values? And in order to answer that question, you had to have them. So it felt like a huge accomplishment just identifying those. And then throughout the course of my therapy and my treatment, I'm constantly referring back to them. Like in order to live up to my value of connection, what, how does that shape my behavior now? Like, what do I need to do to live up to that? So now I, I'm a person who puts my phone down when I'm with other people and pays attention to them. So like, I know that's part of who I am now. Okay. One of my values is love. Like, how do I live that? Well, I give people hugs when they seem open to a hug. <laughs> I don't attack with hugs, but you know, that's another way that I, I can live um, and build up like this is who I am. I really love what you said. I think that was one of the things I had, a, I had a, remember having a conversation with my therapist and being like, what does it mean to have an identity? Like what, what makes somebody have a stable identity? Because so much of the time we identify people by like what they do. 
you know, like, oh, I'm a seamstress. But it's we're more than our jobs, right? We're more than our descriptive qualities. And I think identifying values has been so, so big for a lot of people. And I love everything that you you say about, you know, how you have that list and you found the ones that resonated with you and you just show up as that person. I just want to say... I actually got my values tattooed on my wow. arm. <laughs> Amazing! You'll never forget them now. Yeah. No, I <laughs> cannot forget them. You can just be like, hold so, on one second. Let me check. Hold on. <laughs> Let right. me check my values. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to, I don't usually point out my tattoos to people, but I was like, that's pertinent. Yeah, thank absolutely. you. That's awesome. <laughs> thank so you. So I just wanted to add to the whole values thing. So I also, I, mean, I think a lot of us who go through DBT do the values sheet and, you know, like f figure out some of like one of our long-term goals and values. For me, I always kind of felt like that was like, that was a little easier for me because I already had really strong values. But what was important for me in like having a better sense of identity was kind of figuring out what are the things that I like to do and doing those things a lot more and putting a lot more effort into the things that I do. And then there's still that piece where it's like, yeah, but am I good at this or am I bad at this? And then some, one day I might feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm such a good songwriter. And the next day I'm like, I suck. Why am I even doing this? This is embarrassing. And so it's like a lot of wrestling with that until the point where, you know, you just do it to enjoy yourself. You know, you're not doing it for anyone else. You're doing it for you. Um, and then something else that was important for me is I realized that throughout most of my relationships in my life, I never chose a partner based on shared values or things that I actually wanted in a partner because I had no idea what I wanted in a partner. I kind of just went, got into a relationship like if it just happened and they wanted to be with me I can think of like two boyfriends that I had that like our values really did not align. And like, I can't imagine spending my rest of the rest of my life with these people. Every time that they would do something that was completely against my values, I would brush it aside. So what I've really learned and where I'm at right now as a single person is I know exactly what I want in a partner. And yeah, there's things, you know, there's some give and take, like I'm not going to find exactly what I want, but I know the values and I know how important it is to find someone who shares my values. And then when I, I know that when I get into a relationship, I can be myself and I'm confident in myself. I know that I'm not going to allow my self-worth to like waver based on the status of the relationship, I hope. Um, but knowing what I want in a partner, I think will make that a lot easier for me because I'm not just going to be, you know, in a relationship with someone that I don't really like as a person. The values were kind of really instilled in me as a kid. And so I've always had a strong sense of that, but they've they've morphed and they've changed. I know when we when we speak about values, it's often about like the self, right? Like what's important to us. But I actually found it really helpful and just kind of more organic for me to have values that are related to the self, but also related to things outside of myself. A lot of my work, a lot of what I do, a lot of how I am in the world, like how I want to be is really socially conscious. And that influences most of the things that I do. I find Maybe because of that kind of like social nature of BPD, because we easily attach ourselves to others. I'm an extremely social being, even though I need a ton of quiet time. I found it was easier to define my identity through that kind of more social aspect when I gave it a kind of meaning. Always trying to conduct myself, live in a way that's just generally good in the world, right? Um, whatever that means to me. And I think like morphing that kind of like inner and outer aspects made it really easy for me to have like a core set of values that I could always kind of turn to. And I found myself in that as I grew older and I developed that more myself. Um, and it was actually in a relationship where it wasn't a healthy relationship, but I realized that we had very similar values. And that was the first time I'd ever really been in a relationship with a person where we kind of identified that. Part of it was my BPD trying to be like this other person, the whole like identity fusion thing. But it was also extremely, extremely validating because that, that was the first time where I really clued into what my values were in a way that I could um, express on my own. So finding myself through others, finding myself through the outside world, um, as long as I hold like a piece of myself while I'm doing all of that, I find that that actually comes more organically to me. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense, but that's, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Right. From hearing you guys speak, it seems that two of my values 
are fun and health. That's always been a looming pattern since I was a kid. I always liked running, I always danced, I was a very active person, still am. Found my way back in the gym, yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's something that I always wanted to do, regardless of like if I was in a friendship group or wherever I would be, people would sort of describe me as, oh, you eat really well and you mm. you work out. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like those are two of my values, like fun and health. So I'm going to definitely go back to the drawing board and write it down on my arm right next to George Michael. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I, I definitely have like, um, had like a list of um, values, like in a goals journal, because I didn't do DBT. So like we didn't do any of that stuff. I did uh, mentalizing based therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did like sort of identify maybe like 10 values of mine, but I remember looking at them and thinking, ah, most of this is trash. Like I'm probably going off of somebody else's value systems. Like I had all these pictures of people in my mind, like people I love while I was creating those values. But now that I'm doing blank canvas vibes, I can go back and revisit that value board and be like, yeah, a bit of this, I'll have a bit of that, yeah. So anyone who's seen Sophie's one-on-one interview has heard her say, like, picture my higher self and show up as that bitch. Um, <laughs> that, that line goes through my head all the time. Um, Woo, because right, I relate great. to it so much. Like, when I was early in DBT, I... And I, I, I think this is sort of a product of mindfulness. It was like of being, just trying to be present and aware of who I am and like how I feel about things and and, in relation to the world. And as I started to become more aware and mindful of the moment, I, I was, I was able to kind of develop in my, my mind, this higher self, this, I think DBT would call it, you know, the wise mind, this version of me that integrates sort of reason and emotion and all together. And I, I think that's one of the ways that I have really worked to overcome this identity disturbance is to be like, okay, I kind of know the person that I want to be. How would that person act in this moment? Mm -hmm. Um, And when I'm in real distress, I will sit in my like bathtub and out loud, I will have conversations with myself where I both play like my deeply hurt emotion ruled self and my like higher self. And I will have this conversation with myself and, and work towards integration and becoming something. Now, like after our interview, like that line just runs through my head all the time. Like imagine your higher self and show up and show that up as that bitch. I'm going to get a t-shirt, honey. <laughs> yeah. That's an iconic line that I now want to remember. That's great. <gasps> Thank you. Because it is, I think that that's one thing with your values and like figuring out your sense of self is you kind of, it's just putting one foot in front of the other and making the next, the next right decision for you. You know what I mean? Like you can just say like, well, well, what are my values? Like who, who do I want to be? And then you just act in accordance to that. And it's like step by step by step. If you just keep doing that over and over again, then you are that person. So it's, it's doesn't have to be like a static, like, well, this is who I am. Like it can be something that you develop over time just by acting as, as you envision yourself wanting to act. And I've, I gotta say, I feel almost blessed to have had this issue in the sense that my interpretation of the world, at least, has been most people don't have to think that much about who they are. They kind of figure it out. You know, we have that, we all go through that teenage years where we're like, who am I? And then they figure it out and they just, they just go. And in a way, I feel kind of blessed that I've had the opportunity to really sit and think about who I am. And because, yes, change is really, really hard. And that's why there's this kind of stereotype that, People don't change and they are who they are. But like the reality is if you if you want to put in the, that effort and the work, you can kind of become something that you want to be. Like I never thought it was possible for me to imagine myself as someone who was reliable and didn't just do whatever my emotions ruled in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but I was able to turn myself into almost like, you know, a better version of me. It's not exactly someone else, but in a way it is someone else. Now, looking back, I know, like, to people who are really struggling, like, this may sound bananas, but I don't, if somebody could take away all of my, like, BPD and all that, I don't know if I would want to because I don't, 
I don't know if I would want to be a person that doesn't know all this stuff. That's, that's actually scary to me. The idea that I wouldn't know all these things on such a deep level. It's a sort of a blessing and a curse because it's a very incredibly painful thing to have. But it, on the other hand, like when you kind of, I picture it as like crawling out of that pit, you've done that work and you've kind of discovered these things about yourself. It's, it's kind of hard when you meet with people or, you know, dating people. And when you meet somebody who hasn't done that work, you're like, what do you mean? You don't know these, like, haven't you thought about this? And you're kind of like, come on. <laughs> I got the number to a good therapist. You better figure this stuff out. Yeah, like, I feel like a cartoon character, you know? Like, I've had so many wonderful, colourful stories because of my BPD. I wouldn't have had so many colourful moments if I hadn't had such identity disturbance, you know? Like, it's Mm. a blessing and definitely, yeah, it's a blessing and a curse. But I get to be a cartoon character, so that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I want to ask you guys quickly, like, what was it like having a diagnosis? Like, did was anyone in denial? Did anybody feel like that, you know, it made sense? Like it put a, I don't know, a name to a face, I guess. I was in denial for a very long time until like probably the, the former part of this year. I was like, no, I don't have that. Another family member of mine has it. And no, I don't behave like that. Like I was just very like, nope, it's over there. This is me, leave me alone. Um, and then I was like, okay, everyone has that aha moment. I think it's interesting you brought that up because the last thing I wanted to say was I feel like a lot of us when we get our diagnoses, we actually begin to over-identify with the diagnosis, which makes a lot of sense because we have this identity disturbance. So you tell us we are something, then that's who we become. And Instagram has been such a blessing and social media and stuff to make you feel less alone. But in a way, if you're scrolling through all these BPD posts and you're like, like, yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. When you really want to change, it makes that a little bit more difficult because you have to stop identifying with these things. And it is a little bit hard to let go of that BPD diagnosis. Like for me, it took a really long time. Even when I started to feel like I was doing a lot better, it was still hard for me to stop identifying. Like that was, that was my identity for a while. Like that's who I was. It was like those symptoms, that was my personality. You know, it was like, that's who was me. But For anyone watching this, it is the most important thing not to over-identify with those symptoms. BPD has, we've talked about this in previous episodes, has so many beautiful sides to it once you get better and get rid of all like the crap that comes with it. But that underneath is what you should identify with, not the BPD, because that's not really who you are. That's just some you know mental illness that's covering the beauty that is beneath all of that i think that's important to point out because that's exactly what happened when i when i got diagnosed once somebody could name there was a name to what i had i was like oh my gosh and i started i followed all the people on instagram i read all about it and all this and you do start really i think that's a very common as you said it is common to kind of like that becomes your identity for a while I, I think that's probably normal. And I, I kind of needed that to almost feel again, like that, not so stigmatized and not so alone and not so terrible. I, I kind of needed to go through that for a little bit before I could finally step back and say like, okay, this is something that I am diagnosed with, but it is not my person. Yeah. I think for, for me, I'm kind of sitting here a little bit quieter. And the reason for that is for reasons that are unknown to me, I've never had any kind of therapy for BPD. Um, so I've kind of been on my own with this which is a little bit of a sore point I think it's really helped having my husband and I don't recommend defining yourself by your relationship at all but I feel like he's been a safety net for me in a lot of ways because I feel like with him because I know that he's not going to abandon me that I've had that freedom to go out and explore my values and what my character is without that fear that I'm going to pick the wrong ones, if that makes sense. Um, Like he's not going to leave me if I have a value that he doesn't approve of. Before I would kind of morph myself into what my partner's found attractive rather than what was actually me. I started with looking really at my own moral code and what I felt was right and wrong and then kind of branching out from there to break it down to looking at values. So in a lot of ways, I feel like the black and white thinking was actually quite helpful here because I knew exactly what was right and what was wrong for me. And from there, I could then move on to identifying those values that were going to make up 
sort of me as a person. And I think that really helped as well with going into teaching because it gives you that moral code. Um, and also in terms of dealing with young people as well, you have to be a certain person, you have to have certain values. And although I wouldn't want to make my job my identity, which is something that we've mentioned before, it's definitely helped with that. But yeah, as I said, I haven't done any form of therapy. So this is kind of a learning curve for me as well to have to, to do it myself. Um, but from the things that you have discussed, that's also been really helpful as well to see the other side of it. Katya, though, I think like it's really, really important to hear to hear your side of that because so many people haven't been able to get any therapy, right? And like hearing from, you know, somebody who's kind of navigating things on their own and everybody's at, at a different stage. And I think it's very, very valuable to to hear that. And I think like what you said about going back and starting with like your your morals, um, that's very similar to like what Georgette said, you know, about going through and listing like values, what what actually resonates with me. And we're also, I'm also just going to add what you said about having kind of that stable person who you know is just going to like love you regardless. That is really helpful. I think that's helpful for like anybody, whether you've got BPD or not, like that's validating having that openness with somebody where there isn't that fear gives you freedom to be able to explore, explore different kind of identities, be different ways. And I think we get lost in the BPD thing. And I think we forget that it's completely natural to change. It's natural to go in waves or to see something that you, that you, that seems exciting. And then maybe you go and you try this new thing, you become this new person. And maybe we kind of tend to do it a little bit more extremely or a little bit more like to our own detriment um, sometimes. But I, I bet you this would be a, an episode that like a lot of people could relate to, whether you've got BPD or not. I just went on a tangent, but please don't not speak because you haven't gone to therapy. I think for me, it's more kind of like I'm interested in your experiences because it's not something that I've been through. So I'm just trying to kind of take it all in really. And um, yeah, learn from it, I guess. I want to echo what Jessica said. I think that especially for, and I just think you bring such a great perspective because I feel like, you know, for people listening, they may or may not have this access and to see that you have essentially been treating yourself and are doing quite well is like a really good thing. This is part of the reason we do the show, right? Is I wanted to get as many people with different backgrounds as possible so that we can showcase that it doesn't like DBT, even though like it works very well for some people, not everyone has access and, you know, based on people's comorbidities or whatever they have, it may not be the best fit for them. So like I, I'm so glad that you're here to share your story and your experience because and that's the whole point of the show. So we do have to end. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. This was such a great episode. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, stay tuned. We've got episode four coming out next week. If you like what you see and like what you hear, then make sure to like, subscribe, turn on your notifications so that you do not miss a single episode. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.